Okay, thank you. Mike, 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 Mike. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the invitation to be on this panel. I'm excited to be here. I have the privilege to talk about a number of different years of research that has come out of our lab. And now is probably a good moment to thank Michal, actually, because our, our lab was in part founded on the My Personality Facebook data. I remember flying on an external hard drive into the US in 2011. Is that right? I think so. So um, I'm here to talk on behalf of the World Wellbeing Project. We're a fairly large project, so all I'm showing you is a group effort. Collaborators should be on the last slide. Um, let me dig right in. This is a, I, can, I guess I can skip the introduction a little bit. We've heard so much about it. February 2009, Google came out with this really, really nifty paper showing that they could predict the flu over time using search queries and what the, leading to Google flu trends. What you see on the right here are the predictions made by the CDC and by Google. And you see two things. The first thing you see is that they're very close. And the second thing that you see is that Google is about two weeks ahead of the CDC. Because to listen into the traffic in data centers takes no time. To report up through hospitals takes a lot of time. Right? So the basic play of Google Flutrans was to go from hospital reporting and aggregation to just listening in passively into data traffic that tracks the same interactions because people are Googling medications and their symptoms and so forth. So the question is, can we do that with psychology? Um, this poor lady had to get off her couch to answer this question. It's limited in participants. Can we switch to doing psychology by also listening into data traffic? Fortunately for us, somebody invented social media and the entire world got on social media. It also, not only do we have this huge abundance of data there, but we also have a somewhat of a naturalistic setting that comes with its own biases, and I'll talk a little bit about that, social desirability biases. But to first order, people are talking to one another in a social graph, just like you would talk to your friends, um, and your friends tend to keep you honest. You only say the things you would say to your friends on Facebook, because you know them in real life. Now, we came up with a very, very simple method um, on the basis of some of these data sets, which we call differential language analysis. And it's a very, very simple idea. You have this young gentleman there on the left. This young gentleman fills out a survey, like Michal's person, my personality data. Um, you get normal variables from him that you can quiz the Facebook platform, age, gender, and so forth. And you also get their Facebook data. In our case, we focus on language. Um, there's actually, these, thinking about these different feature sets is actually really interesting. Facebook likes have the advantage that you can use them all around the world. Right? The encoding of Facebook likes will work here and it will work in Burkina Faso. Right? They might like different things, but they're encoded in the same statistical language, in the same um, representation. Um, we like language because we can go from Facebook to Twitter to medical records to surveys to yearbooks. Um, language is a proven technology. We really like it. Um, before we get Facebook data from anyone, we have to ask them for permission. That's always the case when you do Facebook studies. You get these status updates. And then the first task for you in order to operate with this data is to turn all that text into numbers. The simplest way to do that is to count words. And in psychology, this has a long, dis has a long history with linguistic inquiry and word count and similar programs like this that do this for you. And you describe these words as relative frequencies. And then all we do is we take these relative frequencies of words that people use and correlate them with these outcomes. And then we shortlist and show you the, most, the highest correlations. This is equivalent to inspecting what would go into a prediction model. Because the features that are coming out of this sort of univariate feature selection, this very simple correlation, are the same features that will end up driving the coefficients in your regression models. So here's the language that uh, women use. So it's a forced uh, binary gender, self-identified on Facebook. The larger the word, the more predictive it is of being female. So the size of the word encodes correlation strength. The color of the word tracks relative frequency. So from gray to blue to red, rarely used moderately used, very frequently used. The most predictive feature is the less than three heart character, um, followed by shopping and excited. Now, if you compare this with men, <laughs> you see traces of more disagreeableness, less regulation, 
Um, cursing is a very, very interesting phenomenon in our research. We, we joke a lot that we have to deal with it every day. It's in part because if you think about it, cursing is a very intense speech act. It's very different from conveying information. It's designed to elicit an emotion in somebody. It's a very disruptive speech act that, that carries a lot of psychological signal. That's why in a lot of these different contexts you see cursing come up to the point that I will sometimes control cursing out of the equation so I can look at the stuff behind the cursing. Um, but you also see um, things that are psychologically a little more interesting. You see computer games, but you also see sort of competitive concerns, sports teams, tribal stuff. Um, and you notice that the words girlfriend and wife have a possessive in front of it, my girlfriend and my wife. Um, so our algorithms are saying my girlfriend and my wife more predictive of being male than just girlfriend and wife. You don't see that in women. They're happy to talk about other people's boyfriends. Um, <laughs> so predicting gender, right? So very, very much along the line of what Michal has talked about, we can play, there's our little chap again. We have his Facebook data or her Facebook data. We have this language model, which is not a word cloud, but a, basically a regression model with a machine learning twist on it. Nothing complicated. And then we can estimate the gender. We can make an educated guess. And then we can go back to the actual gender that this person reported, ask what's our accuracy. And for something like gender, it's ridiculously high. Right, 92% with words, 94% with likes, ask yourself if you read to the order of 3,000 words that I have written in little updates about me over the course of four years, would you be able to guess my gender? Of course you would. And the story we see time and time again is that some of the algorithms that are running in our brains resemble the algorithms that run in these black boxes in these machine learning models. And that they even make the same mistakes sometimes, as well as have similar accuracies. So psychologically, a little more interesting, here's extroversion. Single most predictive word is the word party. Now you will notice the post hoc thing setting in, in your head. I could have told you that, that makes sense. I, I wonder how many of you would have told me this if I'd asked you this beforehand. Note the word can't wait there on the, on the left. Notice that it doesn't have an apostrophe, so it's contracted because that person couldn't wait. Note the triple exclamation marks, right, above the can't wait. This is, your, this is the person that gets dopaminergic reward from social interactions that is sort of not so great on the impulse control. Here's introverts. Right, so this was, this was introverted internet culture four years ago. I should say all of these are controlled for age at the same time to try to isolate the effect of gender. Um, so this, in, in case you're wondering, this is sort of Japanese culture, anime, um, and these um, Japanese emoticons that are eye-focused instead of mouth-focused. We showed this to computer scientists. They asked if, if they could have a t-shirt of it. <laughs> Predicting personality. So we can play the same game again, same pattern, right? So have somebody's Facebook statuses. We have this language model here represented in a word cloud. We estimate their personality. We compare it to their self-reported personality. And as a twist, we'll now have a friend take a personality survey about you and compare, or fill out a personality survey about you and compare that to our prediction. It's the same data as Michal's presented, so it's, it's the same twist with language. Um, here's your friend's accuracies in predicting your personality as reported by yourself on a big five personality inventory. Here's how well Facebook does. So it meets and exceeds, right? So it meets for most, and openness for some reason seems more predictable with Facebook language than it is guessable by you as a friend. Openness is the trait, of course, that's intellect, that's a little more subtle, that's, that's um, there's a lot of syntax that goes into, a lot of function words that go into openness that we don't have such an easy time picking up on, as the, our Pennebaker friends keep telling us, and that our algorithms are well um, in the position to do well. Right, so about as well as your friend. What about, okay, but, but aren't people just putting on a face on Facebook? Isn't everybody just putting on you know, this show? And can you even do psychology? Well, think about something like depression. So we had people fill out seven items about depression. And um, a few of those items cover a low mood component. Now before, let's, let's protect ourselves from the post hoc game. Now take a moment and think of the word that you think will capture low mood most predictively? What is the one word that you think people will say more who have low mood? It's not an actual quiz. It's more a rhetorical quiz. All right. It's alone. It's not sad. It's alone. So you see, what you're beginning to see here is some of the power of these methods to generate hypotheses 
as we've seen in the previous talks, um, give you inroads into knowing nothing about how to treat depression. Fortunately, we know a lot about how to treat depression, but knowing nothing, that would give us a way to start. Something like social rhythms therapy. Most predictive feature for low self-worth, so the more cognitive component of depression. It's why. I mean, anyone who's into CBT should have gone, yes, at that point, right? It's the, it's the lack of internal structure, of internal coherence. It's doubting yourself, having a lack of sort of sense of self. But it's not just the, the, it's not just the why. And uh, actually, I've covert out the cursing a little bit here so that we can sort of look behind the cursing curtain. Um, you also see a lot of hedging in this. You see apparently, probably, actually, all these things that don't quite commit you to the things that you're saying. Now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to go from people and Facebook to US counties and Twitter. Why US counties? Well, we don't like states. We don't like, so we want to see, can we understand communities with these methods? We really don't like states. There's 50 states. They're not independent observations. It's really, it's, it's to the order 10 independent observations if you have 50 states. It's really easy to draw a regression line through 10 points. We found that when you do analysis on the states there, the effect sizes you see are at least twice as high as you see at the county level. County level is also the level at which you can still get data from government reporting agencies, centers for disease control, that sort of thing. So it's an ideal big data unit of analysis that doesn't aggregate things to a point where you can't trust your correlations. So here's the game again. So we have data from the Centers for Disease Control who reported heart disease as an underlying cause of death on death certificates. So very, very much old data, very clean, good old data. Then there's Twitter. Um, now we have to turn the tweets into numbers again. And rather than count words, we do something else now. We extract topics. Topics, you should think of topics as factors in the language space, like a factor analysis that you can do in the language space that gives you these little clusters of language that's semantically coherent, that seems to capture the same sort of concept in the world. And now we take these topic frequencies, we do 2,000 of them, so every, the language of every county is now described as a distribution over 2,000 of these topics. We correlate every topic and we shortlist again. And we look at this, here's the language that we see associated with higher heart disease. That looks, to me, that looks like antagonistic language, interpersonal tension. There's our cursing, right, the sort of strong speech act but then we also see this, that looks like boredom and fatigue, disengagement, not having a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And we've been surprised over the years how very, very predictive at the individual and community level this engagement piece is. Interest, excitement, sleepiness, boredom, on the other hand. Here's lower heart disease. So here's things that are associated with, this is correlational, associated with a protective effect. So that looks like socioeconomic status. Better jobs, more interesting jobs, being at conferences such as this. Then there's things like having good social relationships, good friends, and good experiences, known to the heart disease literature as the social buffering hypothesis, that even if things go bad in life, as long as you're good friends, you're somehow protected somewhat from the consequences of having those negative predictors. But look at this thing at the top. You can give it a different name, right? So we all look at the clusters, and then as psychological people, we then go there and say, OK, that could be goal pursuit, that could be resilience, that could be optimism. There is some dangers inherent in playing this interpre interpre interpretation game. Um, fortunately, a week after this came out, there was a long longitudinal study that came out that validated optimism as a predictor, um, as a protective factor in atherosclerotic heart disease. Now, how cool is this? We didn't need to know anything about optimism to see this in the data, to find language indicative of it. Now, we can play the same game again, a last time. We take tweets from counties. We have this language model that I showed you in these little clusters. We predict the heart disease, and we ask, how well can we predict heart disease compared to what the CDC tells us it is? So these predictions are always out of sample. We say cross-validated. It's a sort of split half reliability is sort of the same idea, except that you do it in a sort of round robin fashion. On the left is the predictions from the CDC. On the right are predictions that are just made by Twitter. They have no additional information. Um, the correlation is about 0.4. If we weigh it by 
um, population of the county goes up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7, because uh, higher, popu more populous counties tend to have more reliable predictors of both. Here's how well Twitter does compared to standard epidemiological predictors. So we start with demographic factors. They have some predictive power. Then we go to the classical health factors. They're looking stronger. Here's the power of income and education of socioeconomic status. Um, exceeds even smoking. Here's a gold standard epidemiological model that puts everything together. And here's only Twitter. And that's a bit of a significant difference. So, I hope I've convinced you in my little short talk here about three things. Firstly, you can use these methods for insight. You can learn things about phenomena in the world. It's not just black box. Particularly if you use something like language, you can understand language. We have a rich literature. Um, there's a long tradition of language analysis and psychology that helps you understand the processes that are likely implicated. You can do measurement. You can scale data sets. You can make very, very interesting data plays. You can annotate a few users make it very, very expensive data, get their language, build a language model, and then take that language model and apply it to an entire country. So you've built a language proxy of your measurement, and then you measure with it an entire country. Um, or when you do it with likes, Alex uh, Spector talked about this, you can do, with, do this with likes and actually go around the world. So the, the real sort of the second generation of, of this research will really use these very creative data plays to leverage expensive data on white data. And then finally, there are biases here. But if the biases were so strong that they invalidated the inferences we're making from the data, the prediction models wouldn't be as good as they are. Because they tested out of sample, any bias should work against us. So every time we show a, a cross-validated prediction performance, that's a conservative estimate that's attenuated by these biases. So anything you see is at the lower end of what's possible. So thank you very much. Little plug, um, any questions you can raise your hand, um, maybe over there. Yes, yeah, so I think we have time just for one question because we've got to move on to the next last one. Okay, period. little uh, plug, there's, if you like this talk, there's going to be three more talks like it in room nine uh, from our lab. If you want tools, we made a cool website called Lexap where you can where you try to make it as easy as possible for people to use it. Yes? Yeah, uh, it was really cool that, but at the same time for me, it was really surprising that the Twitter data and how accurate uh, it could predict a heart disease because Unlike Facebook data, I think the population of um, people who have heart disease might be different from people yeah. who provide yeah. Twitter data. So what, how would you? It's, it's, it's an excellent question and one I should have mentioned. So the question is, um, the people tweeting are not the people dying. The median age on Twitter is 32. The median age in the US population is about 37. It's close, but clearly it's not in their 60s. Um, what's happening? Well, we think that these, the people on Twitter are actually can canaries, little birds, in their communities. So um, how much stress is there in your community? How much road rage is there? Do you have a food desert? Are there places you can walk and so forth? There's features about the environment that are associated with heart disease where that's unquestioned. There's a separate literature about this. So what we, really, what we think we're doing is we're tapping into this sort of amorphous social component of the community that at its risky end, the people who are at risk for something like heart disease will feel in higher mortality rates. So there, it's a very, very interesting question what it is that we're measuring here. It seems to be some amorphous property of communities. Are we good? Good. Thank you very much.